Welcome to the new place. What do you think? What? You think it looks like a construction zone? Well, I guess two months ago it actually was a construction zone. This is new, new construction right here. And this is the backyard. And the idea is we are going to want to build a small little area for maybe a dog to run around and put in a raised garden bed or something like that. Our big issue right now is that we have these wild cupacabras that kind of run around this area eating everything and they're not scared of anything. So if you want anything to grow, you got to protect it from them. In this particular neighborhood, we also have an issue with cats. You know, the big hairy cats. So, uh, in order to protect any small animals, we're going to have to build a tall fence. And if you build a tall, solid fence, that's going to block out all the light and defeat the purpose of having a garden. And it's probably not the most aesthetic thing for any future residents of this area. So our goal is to build a very modern, welded wire fence on a very tight budget with a limited amount of skills. If that sounds like you and what something you'd want to do for your backyard makeover, hey, follow along. That's worth the effort woodworking gets our hands dirty with a backyard makeover. So I want to drive home to y'all that I am not a carpenter. I, I do not do this kind of work very often. In fact, most of my woodworking is done on a lathe or at a workbench with, you know, hand tools. I mean, I very rarely measure because that's the easiest way for me to introduce errors. Most of the time, I'm sticking one board up to the other, marking those lines and sawing those lines so I know that there's always a perfect fit. Carpentry is just going to depend a lot more on a tape measure. Now, I want to give you uh, our overall goals and plans from the get-go, but that might modify it depending upon what kind of skills level I have once I get out there and whatever errors we pop up at. Right now, we have an apartment that has a carport attached to it. The entry door is right there, and those are on a level foundation. Our original idea is to come out about three feet and put a gate right there, come out eight feet this way, and then 32 feet down, and just make a nice garden dog run. The reason why we are coming out is just my personal experience with terrier type dogs, is that if they can actually see an area, they get less likely to bark when you're not there. If I were to bring the fence over and make it flush with the wall, well, the carport area, the house over there and stuff like that, they couldn't see what any obstructions were to determine whether they should be barking so that they bark at everything. This way, at least, they can see what it is. And I can put the gate right here. Another objective, uh, goal of mine is I want this piece right here to be removable. Not permanently. It's not a gate. I'm probably going to be doing some hinges so that you just can lift it off and move it out. That way, any future residents can remove that one to move stuff in fairly easily instead of working it through two 36-inch doors around the corner. The fence itself is going to be, for lack of a better term, because I'm a furniture maker, a frame and panel design. I'm starting out with uh, welded wires. They are uh, basically 16 feet long when you buy them from the factory and can get them in four or three foot tall sections, roughly. I'm going to be using both of those to, so I can get close to a seven foot height. I cannot fit a 16 foot flimsy gate into my truck, so I'm going to be breaking them down into roughly half. Now, if you understand how they're made, they're made out of square, so I can't take a 16 foot section and make it a perfect eight foot. It's gonna be a little bit less than eight foot just cause you have to cut out a square. But I believe by having a eight foot section, wrapping it with two by fours on all the way around, and then having a post on the side, I should get close to pretty much eight foot sections. 
And that's what I mean by frame and panel. The posts and the 2x4s will be the frame. We'll just drop the wire right down the middle. Which means to create our design, I'm going to have to put a post right there and right there for the gate. One for the corners. And then every eight feet. So this is going to require one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten foot two four by fours, two eight foot two by fours that I'm going to nail or screw to those posts. Uh, I'm talking I'll have to buy eight foot to get the size that I will need. I will need a top two by four and a bottom two by four and a mid two by four. So that is one, two, three more eight foot two by fours and on top of the whole thing I'm going to be putting a two by six as kind of a, a top cap for the whole thing to make it look right. Now right now we are in COVID money pricing for a lot of lumber so the two by month tiers are going to be kind of outrageously expensive compared to normally. A normal two by four in my area is a little over two dollars. Right now they are selling at seven dollars. But the wire fencing in those 16 foot long sections are generally just over 20 bucks. So that's where we're going to be saving a lot of money instead of doing wood paneling, which could be expensive. The wire, welded wire will not only look, look modern, but it will really save us some money. Now in this video, I'm just going to be focusing on the exterior fence. I'm going to leave the gate for another video because I had something kind of cool planned on that one and because the carport and the foundation are the same level and the ground drops quite a bit I do plan on creating a little walkway landing so that the you won't have to step down into the garden area uh, to get into the house. For landscaping I'm just going to be leveling it out quite a bit because this whole place drops that's a high point high corner that drops about a foot and a half over here so I'm going to be throwing a lot of gravel and uh, rock stand from the neighborhood and then I'm just going to put a thin layer of pea gravel on top for easy maintenance and it won't hurt the dog's feet as much that's what they use in most dog kennels so come along as I work best to plan for my incompetence as I build a backyard fence now I just got back from the store picking up uh, the angle iron and I told you earlier that I basically cut it in half what I meant by basically is one of these bars comes in at the eight foot so there's no way I can cut all of them perfectly half I actually had to cut on either one side or the other of the bar so that means I now need to go back and either cut off the, the side that just had the stems or the crossbar and the stems and each one of these is going to end up being a tad bit over 88 inches it is what it is. Now there are a lot of different ways of cutting this. You can just use a bolt cutter, a hacksaw. I happen to have a grinder available to me and that, so that is the easiest and quickest for me to work with. And that leaves us with welded fence that is exactly 88 inches across with a good solid bar, stabilizing bar at each end. And I believe that's important. I'll explain that why in a second. It is also the cause of one of my biggest concerns in this build, which we'll, we'll again talk about in a second. Then after a second trip to the hardware store, you know, I have my four by fours. I've got them in 10 foot long sections so I can bury some of it into the ground and still have enough to build the fence above ground. And I got my two by fours. I did get the ones that aren't a true eight feet long just because at this point in time they were almost three dollars per board cheaper. And then I bunch of, bought a bunch of uh, concrete and some layout tools. All in all so far I believe I'm in this project for about seven hundred and fifty maybe eight hundred dollars but that again is COVID pricing for the materials. I truly believe in normal times somebody could probably build this for 250 300 bucks. Now the part of this project I am stressing about the most 
is putting in these posts. Maybe it's just because of my furniture making background and me getting such tight tolerances here. And the fact that now that I've cut those fences to have a solid bar on each end for stability, I can't change that diameter. So the frame of my panel has to be perfect and I'm doing that into the ground with concrete and rough tools and stuff like that. So I'm really stressing about it. But this is uh, the fence on my parents' place right now. And this is the kind of theme we are going for. Let me show you how they built theirs. Here's a new section my dad just put together to, co to connect uh, the uh, ports that the construction crew built and the new uh, carport so that they didn't have to go down. Uh, basically, following the exact model that they did right there, they put the uprights in and then they put a two by four on bottom roughly measured to the spacing that they wanted. They weren't really concerned about the width of this wire right now. Then they actually split a two by four uh, to create a groove that they could slit on on all four sides and put a two by four on top. The reason why I, I discovered they weren't concerned about it because they didn't care if they had a solid bar on the end. I am because I can see that if you don't have that bar right there, if anybody pushes down on these without that end support holding it up, these can bend pretty easily. I mean, we're just talking finger strength. So, you know, somebody puts a foot down or maybe a dog comes over and gets on them, it would bend and it wouldn't look right. Now, whenever I bought the wires, I did notice that they left about a quarter of an inch proud on each side. I'm thinking that maybe they did that on purpose so that you would put that in there and that would give you a quarter inch of material that you could slice off in case your distancing from left to right wasn't perfect. What these people did was they just put it in, pushed it all to one side and then cut these at whatever length it needed to be. That was their incompetence proofing this design. I don't have that option because I can foresee a dog constantly pushing down on these and them getting out of whack. Plus this design well, it just uses more material and has a few more steps of splitting the wood. Uh, I'm going to try something different and I think I can incorporate in some of that incompetence proofing into this design. It just won't be as easy as snipping a little bit of the metal off to make it fit. Now to test that out, I am going to build one panel. I'm just going to screw it together. Most of this is going to be nailed on, but I want to screw it together so I can disassemble it to actually put it up there. And that will allow me to test the theory and also get exact measurements from a completed panel so that I can have a little bit more confidence in my uh, pole placement. Now in this test frame, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be putting a groove in all the two by forms I'm putting around there. And that's the the wire frame will fit in that groove. I'll make it just a little bit wider, so a little bit of rattling involved for some of the free, free play right there. And I'll probably go about three eighths inch deep, which is only about a third of the way through a two by four, which is roughly one and a half inches. And I'll do that to all of them, so they will all be exactly the same, except for the middle one, which will have that same three eighths inch groove, but I'll put a, a deeper groove on the second side. That way you can build your frame up, slide in the bottom panel, slide in this middle board, and then slide in the top one. And the middle board you can kind of fudge a little bit to get it parallel if for any reason our incompetence introduced some errors. My thinking is that by having only going that groove only going 3 8 inch in if for some reason I put the post too close or maybe they tilt a little bit, I then have up to one inch on each side to increase that groove. If I make it spread out a little bit too far, maybe I can put a, a shims or maybe a nail or something like that to bring them forward a little bit. Worst case scenario, I would put another piece of wood on that to extend the groove. Hopefully that won't happen. So the trick to this whole setup is doing that groove right there. And because most of y'all, I believe, who would be tackling this kind of project would be using a circular saw, that's the tool we're going to use.
Now, anytime you're going to be making repetitive cups, it just makes sense to make a jig. Take, don't worry about laying out each individual piece. Just make a jig for your tools so you can run them all through. I'm just going to use a scrap piece of plywood I found around my shop and the holes that are already in my circular saw. If you don't have holes, you can always uh, install some and just make a fence that allow me to cut a certain distance away from the edge uh, to center cuts on the two by four. To set the distance of that fence, I'm just gonna find center on an extra piece of two by four. I went out and measured the wire, welded wire fence and uh, it is actually three eighths inch thick. So what I can do is I can come over here and give myself a little bit of extra room on either side. This is now my target distance. Now, when I align the fence, what I don't want to do is put the blade on the inside one. I want the, it to rest on as much wood as possible. So I want to align the blade to the outside so that I'm less likely to tip, which on my particular saw just so happens to make this outside in flush, but I'm going to assume that it, it's not like that. So what I want to do is take a measurement from the, this blade right here, which is three and a quarter inches, which means that's where I want to place my fence when I screw it down. So with the fence now securely screwed in place, all I really need to do now is figure out how I can secure those long two by fours so I can rip them along the sides, rotate them, and rip them along the other side to make that three eight plus inch groove. Right, and I've got a spare 2x12 that they were using in the construction, I think, for laying out concrete form. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put two screws in it. But I left both of them a little bit proud so I can push the 2x4 up against it. Now I'm going to put a third screw way off center of that because my saw is going to be coming through here and once again pretty low but not all the way through I can simply bring a 2 by 4 up push it forward push it that way and I have some resistance that can come along and make all those cuts Then to do, to get rid of the, the waste in the center between those two lines, just move the fence over a little bit and make a couple of passes. You'll probably end up doing the whole cycle probably three times to clear out the entire groove, but you'll get it. Well, if you're as fast as I am, that's gonna take you a few hours to do with just the circular saw, but there are other options. You know, if you have a router, you could set up a router fence or well, these might be a little bit too wonky to do on a table saw, but that is an option there. But the good thing is, that's the hardest woodworking part. Everything else is pretty much predetermined. Our vertical dimensions are already set. Because we have a, oh, by the way, all of mine I made a half inch. I didn't do three eighths, I just did them all at a half inch. Six of them I have a half inch from each side, which left a half inch in the middle. So all those dimensions are set. So are the height of my fences. So I can cut all the vertical pieces now before we even start doing and rest assured that they're going to be okay. The parts that I don't know are the parts that are in between the poles that I'm putting in, which once again, I'm worried about, but I can leave those to later on. Now I am going to build that removable gate. I'm going to actually decide to do a removable gate on both ends so I could actually pull them off and drive through if I wanted to. Uh, I'm going to build those tomorrow and those will give me the distance I need between poles 
to create. And that's, well, just take that measurement directly from the piece tomorrow. But I'll build those tomorrow. It's getting kind of late, so we'll pack up today. So to get the vertical dimensions, basically it's just assemble one piece, making sure that you've got the panel completely bottomed in the groove, taking a measurement and adding a quarter inch to that for that planned incompetence we've designed into our system. Then you're going to want to square up the end of one of your blanks, set your measurements and make your cuts. Are you a professional wannabe woodworker? Do you also enjoy a nice, cold, frosty beverage in your shop? Then you need to get yourself a genuine, original, non-patentable, multi-function leather workshop coaster from Worth the Effort Woodworking. I'm okay. Does the idea of venturing all the way to the other side of your workbench to retrieve your sharpening stroke leave you mentally exhausted? Then you need a workshop coaster. Do you have a shop cat? Then you need a workshop coaster. Are you constantly stabilizing boards on your workbench? Band saw, thickness planter set, or miter saw? Then you need a workshop coaster. Would your workshop benefit from a sternum pad, clamp pad, dog repeller, gouge hone, tracing jig, burnishing pad, burr remover, kid repellent, or spouse distractor? Or do you just need proof to all your woodworking buddies that you know what you are doing in the workshop? Then you need to get your own Texas grown, Texas made, genuine, original, non-patentable, multi-function leather work stroke coaster from Worth the Effort Woodworking. Get your three pack of Worth the Effort Woodworking workshop coasters for only $19.99 and 9 tenths, shipping and handling included, while supplies last. Now to get the length of the, or the width of this item, ideally, because this is the gate, so I'm not having to worry about uprights that are out of line, you could do the same exact thing. Put the two ends on it, measure them out, and then measure from the outside to the outside. Or if you actually trust your abilities that what's left of your dado, the meat of it, what's left after it is actually one inch, in my example, on all your boards, you could just measure your gate. Mine is 88 and roughly an eighth inch, we'll say a quarter inch, and add two inches to that. Uh, plus maybe a little bit more for that included incompetence factor. So with all the parts cut, I'm gonna use two two by fours as a substitute for those upright posts. These will lock the gates together, but I'll assemble it the same way I would as if these were the posts, starting with the bottom rail, or the bottom rail. Now, in this design, the bottom base plate actually is not going to be the one that's holding the majority of the weight. Most of that is going to be on these side pieces anchoring into the post. The bottom one is actually almost just trim. So, and I want to screw it to the, to the post, in this case, the two by four that is acting as a post. And because I, I'm gonna be screwing this gate, but on the big fence with the post, I'll use nails. Screws are very likely to split wood at this level. So I am going to have to pre-drill some holes for the screws to go through. So just mark a line drill a couple holes at the end of the board. You don't have to do that in the middle of the board, just the end for screws to go through. Then I'm going to screw the base on both sides to start the process of building up the frame. And, be and before you screw it in, make sure you square everything up. That way the screws kind of help lock it square. From there, it couldn't be easier. I'm starting some screws into one of the vertical stretchers. And the idea is you just take that 
you bump it up against the bottom, you slide in a fence, you put the next cross piece in, you slide in the fence, you put the top piece on. You just work your way up, up from the bottom. I foresee when I got the posts in, I'll put all the bottom plates on and then I can just go through and do each piece side by side. And since I'll be using a nail gun, then it'll go a lot quicker. Well, crap. I thought I had turned the camera on, but I hadn't. But basically, we slid that in there and then screwing this middle piece down right here and right here into that side piece. That locked it all square. So after that, everything's just going to be really easy. Just screw those side pieces in, slide the next piece in, then put the top cap on. Oh, and I have discovered you don't need to slide it down. Just kind of get one side in to the groove. Then just kind of lift up in the middle and bend it into the other side. When everything lines up, it'll spring in. So there we go, one end panel, mostly done. But the key thing is, now that I've got all these measurements and I can pre-cut all these parts, I can get the in-between measurements so that I can at least get a better chance of getting those posting concrete in the ground right. So I guess one good thing about making up a test panel is I can look at that and say, that is way too tall. There's no way a deer's even going to come close to knocking that. I think I'm going to knock it off a little bit, maybe cut two, two levels out, which means the only thing I have to change is the height of these two pieces right here. And since I screwed it together, I can basically unscrew it, cut these off to whatever height I want, and reassemble the whole thing. So now that we got the two end pieces done, I can get those ever important measurements for in between the post. Now, uh, for the ones that are going along the outside, the four long ones, I'm only going to measure to the middle section. I'm not counting this outside post, that's because that's substituted for the post. And in this example, it's 90 and a quarter inches. But for the two end pieces, I'm going to measure from the outside to the outside, plus the space that the hardware. I'm going to use to make those end gates removable. Just quick little pins in the eye hook. That way people moving in, you know, it'll just make things easier. So now we have the critical measurements for the ends and all four of these. So now we just have to lay out the rectangle. And me being paranoid and referring back to my furniture maker woodworking stands, I'm actually gonna use a square to get these 90 degrees. I mean. Let's go back to middle school geometry. You know the three, four, five triangle where you have three, four X, that is going to be five X. So if we just turn the X into a foot, if I cut a three foot and a five foot long board uh, and then just extend out the next one, maybe for the rest of the eight foot long board, I can create a nice triangle to help me lay these out. I can also use those boards to systematically create those measurements so I reduce the chances of my own error. Now when you put this thing together, you have to remember that 345 triangle, that is the outside diameter of the triangle. And, and since these boards are different to it, we have to take that into consideration. So you see right here, I'm buffing it up. Here's the outside corner right there. But up here, the outside corner is this top face right here because I'm going to be aligning that up with the outside corner over here to get my five foot section. 
which means I have this little triangle that I'm going to have to cut off after the fact to get it all so I can bump it up to something. In actuality, I'm just going to cut that one off. So make sure this five foot section is lined up with that corner right there and screw it down. To verify squareness, I'm just lining up with this line on the concrete. Taking my pen chalk line, marking it there. Then marking it here, half that distance is the actual 90. So what I can now do is put a pencil line in there, undo this screw, relocate it so this is lined up perfectly, and I'll know I'm, I'm dead on. At least good enough for construction. And I might as well relocate it now. So that I don't want to cut it off. Now in this part of the country, you know, you kind of clear off the few inches of topsoil before you get to something hard, before you can dig in. So real quickly, I'm going to lay out where I think the post will be within about a foot. I'll draw myself a good foot and that'll be the hole I'm going to dig uh, in the future just to clear away stuff. The first one is going to be right at the center post and the next one I'm just going to put 40 inches out to give myself a nice large door. And then the square comes in. I can bump it up against the foundation, lay it out, and I've got my straight line to mark my next point. Then it's as easy as hooking my tape measure on the end, coming out 93 and a half, which is the width of the fence, uh, of the, the end fence, uh, plus the hardware, and then come out another three and a half inches. And that just so happens to be about an inch off the end of this pole. So there is where I need to draw the first hole. And just walk the triangle all the way down to the end Bump it up against the foundation. Tie a string to a large rock on this end. Place it on our crosshairs. And just walk it all the way down to the other end. And painting right over that string all the way down will give me the perimeters of my fence. Now to figure out the spacing in between those long posts, I have 90 and 3 eighths is the width of the panel. And these, they generally are three and a half, but if you go back and measure them, they range anywhere from three and five eighths to three and a half to, that one's almost three and three quarters width. So it's, that's where that fudge factor is gonna come in in our design. Giving yourself an extra quarter inch on the total length so that the fence can slide in between those grooves and you can accommodate for your mismatch in material. So me to reduce my human error, I'm creating a story stick. So we have the post, we have my quarter inch fudge factor that I'm coming down 90 and 3 eighths. And that'll tell me where my next post is gonna be. Now it's simply a matter of dropping it on the line, lining up one post on one end and marking the post on the next. Rinse and repeat. When I get to this end to figure out the post against the wall, I can simply use a square. So now I know where to clear away the rubble so that I can replace those exact dimensions and start digging holes.
screw that. Well, hopefully your post hole digging was not the ordeal we have here. Uh, hopefully you were just going into nice soil, not solid rock. Uh, I will tell you this, the holes I dug are not deep enough if you're going by the standard rule. Generally they tell you to go at least one third of, of the post into the ground for two thirds above ground. I went maybe 18 to 24 inches, not deep enough for a 10 foot long post, but on the back side I am going to be building up so they will be a lot more sturdier. And my thinking this is solid limestone, we're putting concrete around it, it'd take a lot to push them over. Now I told you all from the get go that my biggest stress was setting these posts in the right order, uh, the right distance to fit my frame and panel design. Well, this distance right here, I have a little bit of give with the hardware I'm using to mount it so that they are removable. I can put those screws in and out quite a bit to make that. Obviously, I want to make it as tight as possible. It's this right here. Not only do I have to get them spaced this way equally, I've got to get them plumb. I also want them to be in line so it looks right. So I'm going to fall back on some of my furniture maker woodworking skills to compensate for the carpentry skills that I don't know, and I'm going to depend upon story sticks. Blocks of wood set to the exact distance. Now I know the panel size that I want to be here, and I have four panels. So if I set the outside corners first, get them locked in, using my square, come out 90 degrees to set those two far corners, well, I can wrap a string around all of it on the bottom and top. That will allow me to get my spacing coming this way and up top and get this action plumb all the way down. So that way I only have to worry about the left and right. I also have four panels here that I want to be perfect. So there's nothing stopping me from cutting the width uh, bottom piece and top piece now and using nailing on the bottom piece and using clamps on the top piece to get that left and right action squared up. Just leaving one of them that I might have to modify for its width to compensate for my incompetency. So let's get going. Mounting this, I'm going to put this one in and what's different is I'm actually going to bolt this one to the foundation in addition to the concrete. <laughs>
mean by making a story stick is I'm making two, I guess you want to call them jigs, that I can set up at 96 and 7 eighths. I've got a block of wood already nailed down there, I screwed on. I'm going to put another one right here at the, my measurement, and I can use these to hold up the end post uh, in parallel to get not only the distance right, but to get them plumb. So I use a square on the ground to line the base up. Then these two made sure that it was perfectly parallel with the opposite side, which I took so much time getting dead on perfect. And it set my distances exactly the way I wanted it. The only thing I then had to worry about was the lean left and right, which I handled with braces. So now I'm just gonna do the same exact thing to the other side, reusing these two braces. So I know it's gonna be at least a rectangle. So I came out this morning and took off, off the braces for both of these and I was running the string line. I've got a string running along the face all the way down that is perfectly parallel with the foundation. That way I can judge where that bottom plate will be to make it level all the way across. And I noticed that the back pole right there, hopefully you can see it in this angle, it, it tilted a little bit whenever I took the braces off of it. So I'm going to take the time and I'm going to go ahead and install those removable fence parts in the back and force that one up level so that I can run a string line along the top in order to place these three other posts in line and make it look right. So how this gate's going to work is I've got these rings and the pins. I'm going to put these on the removable panel and these on the post. That panel isn't that heavy, so I want all the weight to be held with the top post. So on that one, I'm going to position it so it bottoms out. But on the bottom one, I'm actually going to position it so it only comes down about halfway because the bottom one's just going to hold it in place. That way, when you're taking it on and off, all you really have to do is concentrate on getting the top one locked down, and then you can just kind of lift it up a little bit and move it over for the bottom one to seat. It'll just make it, putting it on and off a lot easier. So the first step is to go put these pins consistently on both of those end panels. So from the top, I'm going to come down four inches. And I want you to notice I'm not going to drill the hole in the dead center because that would hit the gate. I'm going to drill it slightly off to the side. And on the bottom, I'll come up about a foot, maybe a foot and a half. Now to figure out the placement to where to drill the hole on the post so it corresponds perfectly and it gets our base lined up exactly where you want. What you want to do is you measure from the base to the bottom of this pin because this one we're actually going to go from the top. That measurement is 72 and a quarter in this example. Now when you mark it, you mark a line at that measurement, but remember that was to the bottom of this pin and we actually want it to rest right here. So we actually want this to be on that line. So we don't want to drill a hole right at that cross point. We actually want to come down so that that's the top of the bit there and drill in that way.
So with that post down there plumb now, I've got a string running on bottom and a string running on top to create a plane. So when I write up the uh, rest of the poles, I just want them to touch that. And all I have to do is consider the lane this way and that way, which those are going to be taken care of again by those jigs or braces or whatever you want to call them. I'm trying to eliminate as many potential points for me to screw this thing up this way. With all the post in, I am just going to verify that my string line is on the base, which is in parallel with the foundation on the other side, so that I can mark them even all the way across. And that will be the starting point for assembling all my panels. Other than that, it's just getting busy doing the work to assemble them, just like we did before. The only difference is that I'm going to be using nails this time for speed and I think it'd probably be smart for me to add weep holes in the bottom boards just so water doesn't accumulate in those grooves. So we now got all the panels done. The last steps for the woodworking for this fence is cutting off the tops flush and adding that top cap. And that how you do the top cap is incredibly important for the overall strength of the fence. You see right now each one of these posts is somewhat independent of each other. They can vibrate separately. But if you put your top cap so that it spans multiple posts, they lock them all together. So what we're going to do is we have four panels right here. I'm only going to use three boards con to connect them all, thus connecting more than one to each other. Now, everybody's fence is going to be different dimensions. So just take the techniques I'm showing you here with it. I'm starting out by putting a 45 on the end of the board because this one's going to be in the middle. I've got them slant it this way and that way.
Now I'll position this board roughly over the center post with the dovetails mainly facing down. Then position and secure it with roughly the overhang I want. Then the next board I cut an opposite dovetail and it will slide up underneath and give me a good join between the two sections. aspect of this project is now done. All that I've really got to do left is to paint it, which I'll wait for a few months until the, the pressure treated wood fully dries out, and build a really cool gate, which that'll be another video out there. But I want you to realize something. How few tools, yeah, I use a jackhammer and I've got uh, a few other tools that y'all might not have, but really everything you could break down to a circular saw, and maybe a hammer and nails. It really was fairly simple. Use a bolt cutter for the, for the wires or maybe even just a jigsaw, but a limited amount of tools. And this thing ain't perfect. If you look down, you can see that the fence line isn't perfect. Most of that I attend to me not driving the nails fully down. But when I put the cross members up, there might have been a nail head gap over there, which is kind of augmented its way up. But over five, 10 years, nobody's going to notice that stuff. This is easily doable. And when you do do yours, maybe you'll end up with something like this. Just a nice, simple, modern little fence design. I'm going to skip the landscaping. I'll do a little montage at the end, but basically it just involved a lot of concrete work, laying down a lot of limestone, peat gravel, and I repurposed a pallet that we had from the construction of the building uh, as a little landing right there. Uh, just nice simple design. The things I really did like about it was how easily it went together and the fact that I can remove these ends. Now, most people won't have an end that is just eight feet long, but I could really see just integrating that as a one panel in a whole backyard just to make easy, uh, it easy to get in and out. One of the few things I probably would do now that I've done it once before is doing these panels consistently worked out great. I only had one panel, which I designed in the setup because I was using those jigs to place it. That third one down, the jigs wouldn't work because, you know, this wasn't perfectly plumb. It actually was only about an inch off, which meant I had to cut these right here. So one of them is a little, these extensions are kind of weak. If I had to do it all over again, I would not cut these right next to bar. I would maybe come out one inch, a half inch, and leave that there to slide, that part to slide in the end. That's a short enough distance that it'd be very unlikely it, for it to bend over time. And it would give you even more incompetency air proofing in that you could trim them back a little bit if you needed to. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I am going to have two more videos in this kind of backyard makeover video. I purchased eight barrels during this build and I'm going to convert all of those into a raised garden kind of container orchard to put back here. And I also have really cool ideas for the gate, which I think you'll be excited about. I'm going to show off a little bit. So if you like this, I hope you'll like, favorite, subscribe, do all those social medias. Maybe go to my website, worthefford.com, where I have those coasters available, which there will also be links down below in addition to a lot of the resources I used in this video. And as always, I want you to remember that it is always worth the effort to learn, create, share with others. Y'all be safe and enjoy the montage.